So um, my name is Dan Hughes. I was the Nick Software webinar trainer from 2009 to 2014. I did all sorts of other things for Nick Software, helped them develop several pieces of software. And um, I, I then moved on to um, Skylum Software. And now I actually teach photography at the Rochester Institute of uh, technology. And I, I actually use these pieces of software, the Nick plugins, in the curriculum as well, talking about all sorts of different things from converting color images to black and white to um, thought processes in directing the viewer's attention in an image, uh, all sorts of stuff like that. And so I want to hit upon some of those points today while uh, walking you through the Silver FX Pro interface and um, getting to know all of the tools that are built into the software. I'm going to be launching the software from Photoshop, but note that the software works almost exactly the same way, whether you're launching from Photolab 2 or uh, Lightroom, the, the software is going to work almost exactly the same way. The major difference is that in Photoshop, you have layers, and therefore you have layer masks, blending modes, smart objects, all of the things that come along with Photoshop. Um, all the stuff that we're talking about today, though, maybe except for a trick or two, um, will apply whether you're using a Silver FX Pro from Lightroom or Photo Lab or Photoshop. So we're here in Photoshop. This is my Nick Selective tool. This is how we access all of the plugins. Um, and there's actually a couple ways to access the plugins from Photoshop. This, this tool here, which is what I tend to use. And then you can also go up to the filter drop down menu, down to the Nick collection, and just click on whichever of the plugins from the suite you're interested in using. Let's go ahead and click on Silver FX Pro 2. The software is going to launch. It's going to convert our color image to black and white for us, and it, it wants to do this in a uh, straightforward and pleasing way, meaning the, the image isn't just desaturated. The photo is being converted to black and white in a certain way, um, rendering, let's say, the red color at a certain luminosity, and that's going to be different than blue or green or magenta or so on and so forth. So it's actually a really wonderful um, way of converting from color to black and white and is actually common practice uh, for most new pieces of software that are that are coming out. Um, so we're in Silver Effects. Let's start on the left side of the interface here. Uh, there's 48 presets that are built into the software. Uh, the first 38 of them are um, have been built into the software since it, it came out since Silver Effects Pro 2 came out. And what I find great about them is they're used for um, single click fixes. So if you like one of these, you just click on it, or you can actually just uh, look at it in the little browser on the left side, and you can see what your image would look like uh, if you utilize that preset. So it's sort of like a heads up display, really easy way of, of getting the potential of the image. Uh, for example, here's a full contrast, number 24. So that has a really interesting look on this image. And then if I go and click on Silhouette, I can actually see in the preset that that's probably not going to be the best preset for this image, um, at least if my conversion the intention is uh, sort of like a regular image, if you will. Like if, if there was a, a very specific use where I needed a Silhouette, then this preset might work. But in our case here, I don't think it's as effective. Uh, anyways, these presets are a really great way to see the potential of your image, uh, a really great way of seeing the potential of the tools. And then also, and oftentimes, you can just click one time. You might be happy with these results, and then you don't have to do anything else. As you get familiar with the software, though, um, you, what, or at least what I end up doing is I will use a preset as a starting point, and then I'll move over into the tools palette on the right side, and I'll start making adjustments to the sliders that have been adjusted um, in that preset. Now, I'm going to scroll back up to the top. We're going to talk about presets later on in the webinar as well. I, I use a lot of presets. I save my own presets. Um, I'll show you how to do that as well. And uh, the beauty of the preset is all of those things we just talked about. And then also, you can create a consistent look and feel um, over a whole swath of images. So let's say you're a photographer who wants to design a book, or you uh, have two or three photos that you want to print, and you want them to look the same on the wall or similar on the wall. Uh, or you use your images online for Instagram or Facebook or something, and you want them to all to have a sort of similar, uh, consistent aesthetic. Creating your own presets 
and then applying those presets and kind of just massaging the image uh, however necessary is going to be a really effective workflow as opposed to you know using the high contrast preset for one image and then hanging that next to um, uh, another image in a, let's say a gallery or in your house using the low key that could work you just have to kind of think about how that's going to work on the wall um, so I guess I, all I'm getting at is that these presets are really great and really powerful and I would recommend creating your own um, and then using them in whatever consistent manner is necessary for your process. Okay, so presets on the left. Moving over the top portion of the toolbar here, we can actually hide the preset bar by clicking on this little button here. An another interesting part of this software is if you just scroll over one of these tools, it'll actually tell you uh, basically what that, that tool is going to be doing for you. Uh, these three buttons are preview buttons with the compare button. I'm gonna talk about those later in the demonstration because we'll be using them throughout. But if I click the compare button right now, you're not gonna actually see any change because we haven't done anything to our picture. So not a super effective uh, tool to show you right now. Anyways, moving into the right side of the interface, uh, we have a zoom capability. And uh, basically there will be a default zoom. In, the, in my case, because I zoomed into 25% and set it there, um, if I were to uh, hit the space bar, I can zoom in and zoom out as a shortcut, and uh, that's gonna zoom to that zoom percentage. If I wanted to zoom into 100%, I can click on the drop down button, a little triangle there, and I can click on any of these different percentages and we can zoom in quickly and easily. And then we can use a navigator that pops up to move around the image as well. You can actually move this navigator as well. If you click and drag the navigator, you can put it on the other side. I think it just sort of bounces between the left and the right corner. I'm not sure it might go into the bottom, yeah. It wants to stick into the corners though. So it's kind of a sticky tool. All right, I'm gonna hit the space bar. That's gonna zoom back out. The last two buttons that we have in the toolbar on the top would be the change background color button. So this is really nice. It cycles between different tones of gray or neutral. Um, so black, white, and gray. And actually it's not really white. It's just a really light gray. Um, and this is super helpful because you might want to look at your image on different toned backgrounds, and that's how you cycle through it. Uh, the last button in the upper right corner, it just hides the uh, tools palette on the right side. And actually a nice little shortcut, which by the way, all of the shortcuts that are built into the NIC collection um, are posted in a FAQ on the NIC software DXO website. So you can find them there. Um, a really quick, nice uh, shortcut that you can use is tapping the tab key. This is a common button. It'll just hide or uh, view your uh, tools palettes on the left and on the right. All right, so we've covered that portion of the interface pretty quickly here. We're uh, going on 15 minutes. I wanna go into the En Vogue presets. This is a new collection of presets that were just be recently built into uh, the Nick collection. Uh, I actually had the honor of creating these presets. And so these are, these are presets that I've created um, you know, over a series of, of months and then um, delivered to DxO, I think in December of last year. And uh, these are presets that I use pretty often. And actually all of these presets, they're kind of designed to just give you a very different look than what's built into the um, uh, presets that were already in the software. And they're all ones that, that I use. So the dark pop and the dark glow are two presets that um, I've, I've applied to numerous of my own photographs. Um, and so I'm super happy and proud that they're in here. We're gonna start with this dark pop preset. And actually, if I toggle between these different presets, especially if I had different tools open, you're gonna see all of the tool sliders adjust as we affect those presets, because all the presets are doing is using the tools that are on the right side of the interface. Um, so it's a nice way to think about it. And uh, it's a good way to kind of learn what these different sliders do, aside from just sliding them around. Um, moving over to the right side of the interface, I'm gonna click on the word brightness, which by the way, anytime you see a little triangle that's to the left of one of these labels, if you click on that label, it's gonna open up into a sort of subset of tools. So in our case with brightness, uh, you have a kind of standard brightness adjustment, but then it also breaks down into highlight brightness, midtones, and shadows. So you can control uh, the different tones of your image, selectively if you will, but um, in a way that's going to basically only adjust that targeted set of tones. So if I take the shadow slider to the left, 
what's happening is the software is looking at the image and looking using the histogram and that information uh, and it's basically darkening the stuff that's on the left side of your histogram that's down here in the lower right corner of the interface if i take the midtone slider up into the right all of the midtones so like the middle gray tones in the image they're going to get lighter and then if i took my highlight slider all the way up to the right we can enhance the contrast nicely um, and we're basically just controlling those values in the uh, right side of the histogram. Moving into contrast, the contrast tool, there's a standard contrast slider, which it, it basically what that does, if you slide it to the left, it's going to flatten out the photograph. I always just point out the histogram there as we make these contrast adjustments, uh, and that gives you a good idea of, you know, what where your image ends up in terms of tones. So if you reduce the contrast, we kind of get this bell curve shape in the histogram. Whereas if I take the slider to the right, it's going to stretch out those highlights, the midtones and the shadows. We're going to get a, a massive increase in the overall contrast. And you can see that reflected in the histogram as well. So depending upon the look of the photo that you want, you can uh, go in and adjust, obviously, the tones as well as the contrast. I think I actually skipped over dynamic contrast, didn't I? I totally did. Let's jump back into the brightness slider. Um, it's, it's, it was silly of me to jump over this dynamic brightness. This slider is a brightness adjustment. I'm going to double click on it, which will home that slider. Uh, and if I drag this slider to the right, it's going to brighten the image, right? And that makes sense. But what dynamic brightness does is it actually brightens the shadows more so than the highlights when you slide it to the right. Right, so what this does is it creates a brighter image overall, kind of a high key image at this point, and uh, but it retains highlight detail, right? So it, it's trying to brighten the photograph, but retain the very brightest values so that we don't blow them out. So if we were to do a kind of comparison here, dynamic brightness is at 100%. You can see that it's this bright image, but there are not, there's no highlights, there's no really bright values that are blown out, that are without detail. Uh, whereas if I take my brightness slider to the right, you can see a difference in the histogram and you can see a major difference in the look of the image. So dynamic brightness is kind of like a brightness 2.0 slider. It's a smart brightness slider and it attempts to brighten the image if you slide it to the right, but retain highlight detail. Or if you drag the slider to the left, it attempts to darken the image, but retain shadow detail. Right, and so now we've got this really moody, low-key photograph um, just by sliding the dynamic brightness slider to the left. So it's one of my favorite tools, and um, one, one of the beauties of Silver Effects, as well as a lot of the other algorithms that are built into the Nick plugins, uh, is the fact that they're proprietary. Right, so this dynamic brightness slider is really only within uh, the Nick plugins, and I think this one, if I remember correctly, there might be a couple filters in uh, Color Effects Pro that have a, an algorithm, a tool that's similar to this. Um, but basically, you'll only get this look out of Silver Effects Pro, and so that's really interesting and cool because now you have a different tool in your tool belt that doesn't really exist anywhere else. Uh, another thing that I find really amazing. And, and I sort of thank DxO for this, is the fact that this piece of software, Silver Effects Pro 2, has been part of my photographic workflow since 2009. And it basically hasn't changed, which means the images that I was outputting in 2009, I've been able to have a, a relatively consistent look and feel, although it's evolved since then. Um, and I've had a tool set that could deliver what I'm looking for. So I like this because software changes so quickly, you know, within a few months, and then the look that you get out of the software is so different. Um, it, I'm super excited and happy that these Nick plugins are going to be, you know, moving into the future um, indefinitely at this point, right? As, as far as as long as DxO is interested in um, sort of retaining this. I, I don't know, by the way, I'll probably get a couple questions based upon that comment um, about you know, what is DxO going to do with the plugins? I have no idea. But what I do know is for now, they are continuing to update them so that they work with contemporary operating systems. And they've just updated um, to, to the Nick Collection 2. So they are developing the software. We added in these presets. And then uh, it's also being upgraded for high-resolution screens and so on and so forth. So I'm happy because 
I'm able to utilize my tools and they're being updated so that they'll function properly on uh, these new computer systems. Okay, off my soapbox. So into uh, the contrast sliders. You've got your standard contrast slider. You have an amplify whites slider, which is basically gonna go in and target the lighter tones of each individual object and then amplify those lighter tones. Amplify blacks does kind of the opposite. What it's looking for as I slide this slider to the right is it's looking for the darkest values of each of these individual objects um, and basically amplifying the blacks, darkening down those shadows. It's a contrast adjustment slider. It's a really powerful tool. And both of these sliders, you can use both uh, globally so that it affects the entire image and then also selectively um, so that you can go in and use control points, viewpoint technology to um, amplify whites and amplify blacks. Now, we spent a good amount of time on this image already. I've been explaining the brightness and contrast. We utilized uh, the dark pop preset. Let's just take a quick side-by-side -side preview of the before and after. On the left, we have the original. We've sort of uh, darkened down the image, added a little bit of contrast. I think I would use some control points here or there on this image to uh, dodge and burn and direct the viewer's attention through the image. But for the sake of time and because I don't want you to get too bored because we're just editing one photo all day at this point, um, I'm going to keep moving and we're going to move on to the next picture. So I'm going to click the OK button in the lower right corner of the interface. That's going to bring us back over into Photoshop. And uh, basically what's going to happen in Photoshop is the original background layer of pixels, the image itself, has been duplicated. And then the uh, adjustments that we made in silver effects are applied to that duplicated layer. So you can see in my layer mask, I've got my original image and then I've got my Silver Effects Pro 2 image um, there. Uh, and so another thing to keep in mind is that you've got layers, layer masks, blending modes, it's a non-destructive manner or non-destructive workflow because we can always go back to the original background. And had this image uh, been shot raw and then opened as a smart object, um, the plugins in Photoshop will operate using smart object capabilities as well. So let's move into the next photograph. We've got a nice sort of studio portrait here of my buddy John. Um, I would generally start with a preset, but uh, because we've already kind of talked about presets, I'm going to go ahead and hide them for now. And uh, I want to talk to you about the structure tool. And then I also want to point out the color filters on this image. Uh, and th these color filters, for anyone who shot black and white film or shoots black and white film, um, these filters work just like putting a glass filter would in front of your lens. So if I click on the red filter, it's basically going to lighten up anything that's on the red end of the color spectrum. So that'd be, you know, red and yellow and or red and orange and then into the yellows. Um, and then if I click on the blue color filter, it's going to lighten up anything on that end of the color spectrum and darken down anything on the opposite end of the color spectrum. So if I click on the blue color filter, because John's skin tone is primarily made up of red and yellow, his skin is going to go very dark, right? As I click on these different color filters, you can see how those tones transition and change based upon uh, that color filter. So this, this is a very common tool to use in analog film photography. I find it to be a very powerful tool here, not only because you have sort of these five standards of color filters, which by the way, there were more glass color filters than this, or there are more, but these are sort of like the five most common ones. You can actually create your own color filter as well. By clicking on the word details, you have a hue slider, which would be choosing the color of your color filter. And again, what's gonna happen is whatever color you choose, like red, it's on red right now, it's gonna lighten up those colors and tones, and it's gonna darken down anything that's on the opposite end of the color spectrum. This is an image with just skin tone and a background, so it's hard to kind of get a, a real feel for what it's doing. But the beauty of this is that you can create your own and then you can even adjust the strength, right? So this would be even more powerful than what most folks could do with glass color filters because of several reasons. First of all, you've got the ability to choose it after the fact. Whereas when shooting film, you would generally choose a color filter or maybe two color filters and um, shoot a few exposures with the glass filter in front of your camera. Here, you shoot you know, a perfect color exposure, and then when you're converting to black and white, can 
um, generate these same kinds of results. So I like this red color filter. I'm setting it to 77%. I'm going to close the color filter section and move into the structure tool. Uh, I also very quickly just want to go to the go to webinar control panel. Okay. Yep, we're at the maximum number of people here. It looks like there's a, a bunch of people trying to get in. And um, Okay, a lot of questions coming in. I'll definitely uh, save them until the end of the webinar. There's a, there's, we've got 501 people, which is the maximum number of people for this webinar. So I'm glad you made it. Um, and there's more people trying to get in now. So soft contrast, because we talked about Amplify Whites and Amplify Blacks. I will be using soft contrast throughout the webinar. If you slide this slider to the right, um, it's, it's kind of like an adaptive contrast slider. And what, it, what that means is the software is looking at the image. It knows where the edges and where the areas of the image or the stuff is in the photograph. And as you slide this slider to the right, you can actually kind of see John's outline in the background. Right, and what this algorithm does is it, as you slide it to the right, is it creates this soft glowing effect. It's a soft contrast. If you slide it to, sorry, I'm sorry, if you slide it to the right, it gives you an increased amount of contrast, and it kind of creates this soft glowing effect. If you slide it to the left, it's the total opposite. It's this harsh kind of flattening of the tones. And again, you can see that reflected in the histogram as I slide that left and right. Um, I will add just a little bit of soft contrast in this image to kind of soften the glow of the overall photo. I'm going to amplify the whites a little bit. And then I also need to go into my brightness, into my shadow slider. And um, I'm going to increase the dynamic brightness and increase the shadows just a little bit to bring out the details in his shirt. Because before, I think even in the original image, you could barely see any of those details in the shirt. And now we've got this nice sort of soft glowing overall photo uh, of my buddy John. So moving into structure. Structure, and let's zoom in a couple times. So structure is basically a, a texture adjustment. John's got really good skin as well for um, considering he's in California and is outside all the time. But the structure slider, if you slide this slider to the right, you can see what it does. It, it increases the texture that already exists in the image. So I'm going to double click on structure. It homes that slider. And then I'm just going to slide that slider slowly, slowly to the right. And you can see now we're getting this really nice texture out of the overall image. Now, one thing to note, though, is that sometimes the structure tool, and it, sometimes these kinds of, if you will, sharpening tools, can do some funky things around edges that are like out of focus. So watch this area back here around his head and his ear. If I double click on structure, you'll actually see those tones change a bit. And so, um, you know, whereas I might like structure at like 60% on the parts of the image that are in focus, it doesn't look so good on the stuff that's out of focus. So what I find myself doing more often than not is actually only using a little bit of structure globally on, on a lot of images. And of course, I'm speaking generally right now. Um, and then using control points, I will selectively increase or decrease the structure uh, to direct the viewer's attention through the image. Like John's eyes here are a little bit dark and they could use a little more texture. So what I might do, I'm gonna skip over uh, these structure sliders for now, move into the selective adjustment section and use a control point to selectively dodge his eyes and also add a little bit of structure. Let's see what happens. So um, control points, by the way, for anyone who's not familiar, basically allows us to just point at an object, place the point on the object, and then control the different um, adjustment capabilities of the software on that object. So in this case, I place a point on his eye. I'm gonna size the area of influence, which is that circle that's going around the point. We'll talk about those more in a little bit. Um, and then from there, I can control brightness, contrast, structure, amplify the whites, amplify the blacks, find structure. And then there's even a selective colorization slider so if I wanted to reintroduce color into our black and white image, we could totally do that. Um, and then this also kind of gives you an indication without looking at the mask, because there is a way of looking at the mask that this control point is making, um, to see what this control point is actually affecting. Right? So if I size my area of influence to be very, very small, we're only going to be affecting these similar tones 
colors, and textures. As I drag my control point around, what's happening, because I've, I've taken my selective colorization slider, brought it all the way up to 100%, is you're kind of seeing the mask that the point is making. Now, what I wanna do though, is I really only wanna affect his eye. I don't wanna affect the flesh or the white of his eye. I just wanna adjust the pupil, sorry. Uh, yeah, the pupil and maybe a little bit in the iris. Um, so, right, yeah, anyways. We're, we're gonna click the plus or the control point button. I'm gonna place another point in uh, on the flesh of his eye. And what happens is as you add more control points, each control point actually gets smarter. Meaning as I put a control point um, on his eye here, I'm telling the software that we want this point to affect his eye. And if I put a point on the, the skin underneath his eye, I'm telling this control point to independently control that part. So they talk to each other, and now I can kind of go in and make a much more precise adjustment. So the, the more control points you add, the smarter each control point gets. So I'm gonna increase the whites. I've added a little bit of structure. I'm gonna increase uh, the brightness just a little bit. You do have to be very careful if you're gonna adjust eyes and portraits because it's, it's, it's easy to kind of go overboard. Like if I bring up this to 70% or something, it, he sound, it suddenly looks like the son of Rasputin or something, right? Uh, so that, that doesn't work. But if I just bring the brightness up maybe 20% or 15%, now your eye is going to be drawn to his eyes because basically they're brighter. And the human eye, your, as a viewer of an image or as a viewer of a TV show or a movie or something, it's, it's gonna be attracted to the brightest most contrasty, most saturated areas, um, aside from the human form and human face. So those are sort of like the, the top down. Your eye is always going to go towards the human form and the human face and the eyes, and then most contrasty, brightest, and most saturated areas. So if I want to attract your eye as the viewer, I'm going to add contrast. I'm going to add um, brightness, going to brighten that area up and probably add structure or or sharpening because the stuff is going to look more in focus if I do that. Um, if I want to distract your eye away from something, I'm going to darken it down. I'm going to um, maybe blur it and I would probably reduce saturation, although that doesn't matter in our case here because we're converting images to black and white. If I want to show more form and, and shape as if my lighting was, was better than it was, I can go and place control points and I can go and dodge and burn darken down those shadows, and it's going to seem like um, we've got more dimension from that light. And again, what these control points are doing, as I place a point, it's looking for the similar tones, colors, and textures that we've dropped the point on. And then we're able to then adjust uh, the brightness, the contrast, the saturation, and so on. No, not really saturation in this case because we're in silver effects, but generally speaking. Um, I also use a shortcut shift command A and that's gonna generate a new control point. So I'll show you that in a second. So right now I'm done with this control point. I want another point over here. Rather than having to go over to the control points button here, I can just hit shift command A on a Mac or shift control A on a PC. And then it, my cursor turns into a little crosshair and I can drop the point on the object that I want to adjust. So I'll go ahead and darken that down. And now we're getting some nice form and some nice shape um, out of our portrait of, of John. In fact, if we look at the before and after, um, I used the red color filter and we kind of adapted it and then a couple control points to kind of dodge the, the image. And it's a very different looking photograph now, right? Went from somewhat ruddy and underexposed uh, to a little bit more of an open portrait. Uh, actually, I'm happy with our result, except I wanna finish with uh, finishing adjustments. And that is, if I click on the right side into our tools palette here, I'm gonna add a vignette onto the image. The finishing adjustments um, basically are exactly that. They're used to kind of refine the overall photo at the end of your workflow. In fact, a general order of operations, and, and of course, I have to speak generally because your, your workflow might be different depending upon the images that you'd, you'd be shooting and what kind of controls you wanna use. The general workflow and design methods here in Silver Effects and in most of the Nick plugins is to start with a preset because that's going to do the bulk of the work for you, ideally. Therefore, you don't have to spend as much time trying to slide sliders around and so on. 
and then you work from the top down. Now, the, the only time that I wouldn't work from the top down is if I'm going to be utilizing color filters, I'd actually probably start with a preset and then use a color filter if I'm going to play with those and use them, um, and then go to global adjustments and kind of work my way down from there. Um, you know, the idea there is that you go from a global adjustment, the big, broad stuff, down into the more specific stuff. So uh, applying a vignette, each of these finishing adjustments has a little pop-up or drop-down menu, and there are presets built into it. You can always, though, you can click on a preset if you want and use that, but you can always just create your own. So again, there's a little triangle here, and we can click on uh, the word vignette, and it opens up into our vignette tool. We can lighten the vignette or darken the vignette, or in my case, that I, I kind of said that opposite. We can lighten the vignette by sliding the slider to the right. We can darken it by sliding that amount slider to the left. You can change the shape of the vignette, and then you can change the size, which is how far into the middle the effect encroaches. So if I just want a very sort of broad, darkened edge, I'm going to take that sli size slider to the left, and it's going to reduce how far into the image that vignette is going to be affecting. Um, and lastly, in the, in the vignette tool, you can place the center of that vignette. So if you click the Place Center button, the, the default is going to be right in the center of the image. But if I wanted to maybe shift it down or up or to the left or to the right, you click the Place Center button, and then you can go in and kind of replace the center. So I'll say that's the center of our vignette, and it sort of shifted it very um, kind of subtly. Let's, let's take a look at that in a more extreme value. So I've taken the amount slider down to 100 negative 100. If I move my center over here, you can see now we encroach further into the left and into the top. I'm going to go ahead and shift this back. And then I need to reduce the amount of the vignette. Let's bring that, just make it kind of subtle. And then actually I'm going to encroach a little bit further. And so one more quick look at the before and after. I kind of, maybe I, I added a little more contrast than we need. Let's reduce that just a touch. There we go and then actually even darken this thing down with dynamic brightness. There we go, I like that. So if we look at the left and the right image, we've got completely different photos. I kind of like both. That's my problem too sometimes, is that I'll, I'll make three or four versions of the same image and then decide what I like. And actually sometimes, I'm gonna click the okay button by the way. Sometimes um, I'll actually make two or three versions of the same image, and if I'm in Photoshop, I can actually blend those together. And I'll, we don't have enough time to go into detail about how to do that, but I'll show you um, what, what the final image looks like or can look like when you do that. So I have another um, image here. This is my, my new niece. She's a very beautiful uh, little girl. And um, I've, this is probably closer to what my workflow would generally look like, especially if I'm mixing a couple layers of silver effects. So this is a photo that was shot on a, a Fujifilm GFX camera and it's right out of camera it looked pretty good but I went into uh, Adobe Camera Raw nope sorry this one I think I adjusted in uh, Photo Lab 2 um, tweaked the color a little bit because I think my color balance was a little bit off in camera and then I actually brightened the image up a little bit I brought it into Photoshop and used Color Effects Pro so you can see just a shift of, of sort of I think I added cross processing and a dark and light and center filter using color effects. And then I went and converted from color to black and white using silver effects. And I said, okay, that's cool. I like this, but the, the contrast down here in the tone or the value of um, the, the bib here isn't exactly what I wanted. So I, I turn off my silver effects layer, click into this color effects layer, which basically yields me my color information one more time, right? So I can start over, I can reconvert the black and white image. And then I created uh, this version where the, um, this is at 85%. So basically I created this version where it, the skin tone is a little more ruddy. I've got more contrast in the yellow stuff that's on her face from, from eating her breakfast, right? I think she had carrots and a banana. Um, and anyways, I utilized the layer mask here to kind of generate the contrast that I liked more in, um, in the bib. So now I've got my final image, and I've kind of converted the photo two times 
one using um, the yellow color filter and then one using the blue color filter and getting that nice dark tone. But it's just an, a, a trick that you can use in a more advanced kind of workflow using the Nick plugins, whether that's silver effects or whatever tools you're, you're utilizing at the time. All right, so we've got a couple more tools to get into. I wanna just check my GoToWebinar control panel. Yeah, it looks like there's more people trying to get in. Um, cool. Nobody's having any problems. I can see a bunch of questions coming in. Uh, you're using Photoshop expected DxO bottle. Yep, so in Jez, good question. So um, Jez was actually just saying, disappointed that we're using Photoshop, um, You know, expected to go from the DxO editor which is bundled with the Nick collection too. So if you don't have the Nick collection and you purchase the Nick collection now, uh, you'll actually receive a copy of DxO Photo Lab, um, and, and that's this software, and it's an extremely powerful raw processing tool. And what the heck, why don't we just present this image from here? Um, I do wanna crop this photo. So we'll go over into this image. I'm gonna change my crop uh, to square. So I'll go one to one. And then I'm just going to go and change the positioning of that crop. And this is for so folks who are using um, DxO Photo Lab right now, um, or maybe folks who only use Photoshop or Lightroom. This is a completely different raw processor. It's extremely powerful. It's built by DxO, who is of course the owner of the Nick Collection uh, now, and they have integrated the Nick Collection launcher, meaning we can use Photo Lab too. And we can use the Nick collection um, in a kind of all-in-one workflow. Uh, actually, before I do that, I just realized that my exposure, I need to change my um, selective tone and bring my highlights down just a little bit. And then maybe even see what the DxO Clearview algorithm would do to the image. Yeah, that's better. Okay, let's just, I just wanna show you the before and after. If I click and hold the compare button, um, this is the before and here's the after. And what I did was I, I used the DxO uh, Clearview algorithm that added some nice texture, darkened down some of the shadows, but retained detail. And then I also darkened down the highlights to get some detail in our clouds. We could probably take it further. But long story short, to launch the software from the DxO Photo Lab 2, you move into the lower right corner, click on the Nick collection, and then your uh, plugin selector comes up, a little browser. Now, we had a question earlier about the way that Nick software handles 8-bit or 16-bit per channel files. Um, both Lightroom and um, Photolab 2 allow you to have these settings kind of in a, in a little browser form. And if uh, you click into the settings section here, you can basically tell the software whether you want to be using a JPEG or a TIFF file, or if you want it to be 16-bit, or if you want it to be you know, 300 DPI, PPI, or 240, or whatever. Um, you can adjust that in here. So um, th that should answer that. Uh, if you're in Photoshop, you would use the modes, the mode drop-down menu, um, or probably in a, in a better workflow, if you're shooting raw, you'll make sure that you're opening the raw file into Photoshop as a 16-bit per channel file. So I've gone ahead and clicked on Silver FX Pro. The software is going to launch, and uh, you'll actually, when we, when we come back over into DxO, what you'll notice is that we'll have a duplicated image. So in Photoshop, you have a background layer, and then you have your um, duplicated layer. In Lightroom and in DxO Photo Lab, you will have your original RAW file or your original file if you didn't shoot RAW, maybe JPEG or TIFF, um, and then you will have a duplicated version. So you'll end up with two different files um, in your in your workflow, which is fine, great. It's just a, a little difference between uh, using the software from Photoshop or using the software from uh, the other two host softwares. All right, so let's talk about control points. Control points, uh, you, you add them by clicking the control point button or the shortcut shift command A. They allow you to selectively dodge and burn and adjust color if you're within, let's say, Viveza 2 or um, other, other plugins, you have different capabilities. But basically, each control point, as you add a control point, is going to make its own selection. And it's making its own selection inside of this circle, though it's not making a circular selection unless the object that you've placed the point on is a circle, right? Or if I make this really small, 
and I place the point like in the big in the, the middle of this large sky, it's going to kind of make a circular selection, right? You can see that as I bring the brightness slider to the right. But as soon as I start bringing this out, what's happening is the control point is recognizing that we've placed the point on the sky, and that this control point probably really shouldn't be adjusting this completely different object over here. So uh, the, the control point makes a smart selection and allows you, again, to control brightness and contrast and structure and all of these other slider adjustments. By the way, if your sliders don't pop up like this, like if you open and add a control point on an image and you have brightness, contrast, and structure, the way that you open it up is by clicking this little triangle. And that's going to launch or, or um, expand into the uh, other tool set that you have the capability of using. So let's quickly take a look at what this selection looks like with the control point. This is this is one of the most important tools in the software, by the way, or I would say so, from you know my humble opinion. The control points are going to be um, giving you the most control over selectively dodging and burning and, and attracting or pushing the viewer's attention towards other objects. And especially with a black and white image, this is important because we don't have any color to speak of for the most part. Uh, we generally are converting the color to black and white, and therefore we're left with tones and shapes. And the way to direct the viewer's attention is by lightening certain areas and darkening other areas to kind of uh, direct the viewer's attention through the photo. And so one thing that works well often is a thing called checkerboarding. And that's where you have a light to dark to light to dark kind of uh, contrast or kind of composition. Um, and then this is what's going to help to kind of create these shapes and all of these nice leading lines as well. So to direct the viewer's attention through the image, we're going to add control points onto these different objects and areas, and basically dodge and burn and um, try to um, direct the viewer's attention through the image. Now, the, the thing about this is that these control points, they're making a selection. Oftentimes, you want to see what the selection is. And to do that, you move into the selective adjustments into the control point area here, and you literally click on the words control points. This is going to open up into a list of all of the control points that you have on your image. Um, on the left side, there's a little checkbox that will turn that particular control point on or off. So you can see a before and after. You have the name of the control point, which you can't change, by the way. It's just they're just named control points one through however many control points you have. And then there's a number. And this number is, is the size of the area of influence. So this number set to 70 right now, that basically means it's covering 70% of the picture. It doesn't mean it's affecting 70% of the image, it's just covering 70% of the image. What it's affecting is the stuff that is illuminated when you click on this little checkbox that's to the far right of each of these control points. And the beauty of these points is that they're making a very photographic looking selection so then when you make an adjustment to brightness or contrast or whatever, the overall effect is going to be photographic looking. Now, what you're seeing here is anything that's white has the complete adjustment or whatever the sliders are set to, we're going to affect that area completely. So this area in the clouds, it's getting all of the, the brunt of the effect. You can see this area of the, the sky as well is getting a lot of the effect, but you're seeing almost none of um, the the mining contraption um, affected by this control point. And that's why it's black or very dark gray. Now, if you click on your control point and you start dragging it around, you can actually see um, the real time selection that's being made. So I drag it down into the reflection shadow of the contraption. I drag it into the trees, obviously sizing the area of influence, we're gonna get a different effect, right? And a different kind of tolerance, if you will. Uh, and basically, I'm going to place this point here, and I want to create more of a checkerboarding, so that's why I've dodged this area, I've brightened it up. Now, I want to turn off that selection, so I'm going to go back over into the tools, or the selective control point area, and I'm going to go ahead and click on that checkbox. That's going to turn that off, and voila, now I've got my beautiful control point adjustment. Now, before I add more control points on the image, I actually want to utilize a film type on this photograph. And because the film type here is a global adjustment, because it's going to sort of do this wide swath adjustment to the whole photograph, 
I kind of want to do that before I go in and I make very specific dodging and burning decisions because I need to see what my global image looks like. Now in film types, let's close down the different tools. Uh, you have a drop down menu that have kind of the 18 most popular films uh, that were out when the software was developed, um, except for Panatomic X. That had been discontinued in like 1985 or something like that. Um, really beautiful film. Now, um, each of these film types are gonna emulate what this image would have looked like had it been shot with that particular film. And what it's doing is it's overlaying film grain, it's changing the way the colors are being converted from color to black and white, and then it also has a, a curve that's applied to it based upon that particular film type. So if you like one of these, but maybe it's not totally perfect for your image, you can of course go in and change what's going on there. So let's say we like the Ilford HP5 plus 400. I can click on it, then I can move into the grain slider and we can add more grain by sliding the grain slider to the left, or we can, um, well, technically we can make larger grain by sliding the um, grain per pixel slider to the left, or if we want less grain or no grain, we can slide that slider all the way to the right, and basically we're only gonna have whatever noise was in our digital capture. Um, now, watch this one. This is a cool little thing that you can sort of think about. So um, in film, you're gonna have a certain amount of grain in highlight areas, in mid-tone areas, and in shadow areas, because on film, it's the grain that makes up the image, right? But uh, here in the digital sort of world, it, it works a different way because those photo sites are going to go in and be, you know, you're getting your pixels out of your image um, I, rather than going really deep into detail there and explaining what this, this grain is doing. You are actually emulating the film grain based upon the tone of the image. So if I go in and I adjust the brightness or the contrast in the photo, you can see the grain actually dancing around. And that's because now we're getting different amounts of grain in the shadows, the midtones, and the highlights based upon that shadow, midtone, and highlight. So it, the, the grain tool in the film adjustment, it's not just slapping grain over the image and calling it a day. It's completely based upon the image itself and then uh, the contrast itself and the objects in the image. So it's definitely an interesting tool and it makes a really beautiful grain. Um, and, and this is a great tool. If, if you have a like a high ISO image and you've got grain in your image that doesn't look particularly good, you can go in and throw a little bit of this film grain on there. And typically um, it'll be more convincing as grain and it'll look um, it'll, it'll look a little bit, I don't know, more highfalutin or something. It, it seems to be prettier than a lot of high noise um, images. Moving into the color sensitivity sliders. Uh, this is how the colors actually convert from color to black and white. So uh, the sky there is blue and cyan, and if I wanted it to be darker in its conversion, I can actually take this slider and I can um, basically adjust the way that those tones are being converted from color to black and white. Um, folks who are familiar with the HSL tool, the hue, saturation, and luminance tool in, let's say, Lightroom, for example, um, you have a similar set of controls as well. Works the same way. The beauty here is that you can, um, you know, match this or pair this with all of the rest of the tools that are built into Silver FX. Um, here we go. So color sensitivity and then the levels and curves. So this is the curve that's associated with the Ilford HP5 film. Um, if we wanted our midtone to be a little bit brighter, we can go in and adjust that. You can add new points to your curve. Um, you can you know, take your highlights down and so on and mute the whole thing. Like if you wanted a dark muted image uh, or anything you might want, you have a level and curve capability built right into your silver effects. And again, this one was when we clicked on HP5, the um, curve that was established from the HP5 scans that were used to create that film emulation. Um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff went into developing this software, if you, if you couldn't tell already. Um, so we're coming up on the amount of time that we have for the webinar. I wanna transition into a Q&A here. I know we've got a lot of questions uh, ready to go. We, we didn't actually get through all of the finishing adjustments. So just very quickly, I wanna go over this. Um, you have a toning section here. You have 24 presets built into the toning section. Uh, from there, you can actually adjust and create your own tones. So we can increase or decrease the strength. You can change the paper hue or the silver hue, which by the way, what that does, silver hue 
is going to affect the dark values in the image. So if the silver hue is set to blue, you'll see all of the shadows are going to be more blue. And if the paper hue is set to a different color, in this case now it's set to yellow, um, we're gonna get this kind of split toning effect. And uh, at this point it's pretty extreme because the strength is so high. But um, in this way, the paper hue slider is going to affect the highlights and the silver hue slider is going to affect the shadows. And now when I start to dial back the strength of the overall effect, um, we're going to be revealed with this really kind of subtle, but nice split toned um, effect, which in this case is kind of works nicely with the two colors. Oops, close finishing adjustments. Um, underneath finishing adjust or underneath uh, vignettes, you have a burn edges. So this is kind of like a vignette, but it literally just burns the edges down. You can go in and create your own version of that as well. So if I wanted the top edge of the image burned, and then we wanted it to transition softly and then go way into the image, we can kind of go in and do that one edge at a time, as opposed to the vignette tool uh, where it's going to be affecting all four sides at the same time. Let's burn the left side just a little bit, transition that in, set the size, and then I'll dial that back just a touch. And by burning these edges down, even very subtly at something like 4%, that's gonna kind of push the viewer's attention towards the middle of the image. And in this case, since it's a square image, the one-to-one, -one, it, it works pretty effectively. Finally, image borders. So the image borders uh, basically give you the ability to create a little finished edge effect as if you were in the dark room and you had a, a 35 millimeter, a six by six holder in your Omega enlarger and you scratched out your, um, you took a file and filed out your, your film holder. Uh, this is gonna yield you a, a similar kind of effect. And you can change the size, you can change the spread or the thickness of the stroke that's around uh, the image. And then you can also have a more clean or a rougher edge there. So let's say we're happy with these. Let's take a quick look at the before and after. Here's the before. Here's our after. After we finished our black and white conversion, we click the save button in the lower right corner. That's going to bring us back into our host software. And uh, we will have our original image in our grouping and then the black and white converted photo right next to it. And in my case, since I told it to be a 16-bit per channel TIFF file, this is saved as a 16-bit per channel TIFF file. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I think that's that's about time for our presentation. Um, I think we've got a lot of questions that have gone into uh, the GoToWebinar control panel. So I'm gonna try and answer a couple of these and I'll stick around to answer as many as possible. But um, I'm actually conducting this webinar from uh, New Hartford, New York. And after the webinar, I'm gonna be driving a couple hours away to help uh, my sister and brother-in-law uh, at their camp. So, um, I want to stick around and answer as many questions as possible, but if we've got you know 500 questions coming in, it might uh, it might take us a while. So I, I want to for anyone who's not going to stick around for the Q&A, thank you very much for joining the webinar today. Hopefully you found it to be beneficial. I love doing this stuff. It, it's quite enjoyable to just get to talk about um, how this software works, and hopefully you found it to be beneficial as well. Uh, thanks again for joining, and uh, feel free to type any questions you have uh, into your questions box. How do you save a custom preset? Yep, David, good call. I did say I was going to show you that one. Why don't I jump over into Photoshop because I've got a couple other images open. So if I wanted to save a preset in uh, Silver SilverFX, uh, we would make our adjustments. And then um, on the left side, there's a custom section. I'll show you. I'm just going to talk through it as this is loading. Um, let's say I use the En Vogue preset dark selenium, and then I just increase the structure some more, and I say, okay, I love this. I want to save this as my own preset. Um, what you would do is move into the custom section here on the left, lower left corner of the interface, click the plus button in the custom section, and then name the preset something. So let's name this one um, dark selenium two custom for webinar and then click OK. And once you've named it and clicked OK, your um, custom presets will come up and it will be saved in alphabetical order. Great question, David. Thank you for reminding me. Um, Kevin, you said the 
the grain amount per pixel, I'm not sure how there can be more than one possible thing happening to each individual pixel. Did I hear it wrong? Did you say the grain amount is per pixel? I see. So um, in the film types, in the grain section, basically what's happening is the software is trying to create a certain number of grains per pixel on the image. So if there's, you know, this is 48 megapixels, right? And so for each pixel, right now, I have 500 grains per pixel. I'm not sure if that translates really well, but basically if I were to slide my grain per pixel over to one grain per pixel, now if we zoom in, basically each grain, each pixel is represented by a piece of grain, right? So I've zoomed into 400%, so we're way in here. But but now as I slide my grain per pixel slider to the right, we're getting um, less grain per pixel, therefore we don't see as much of it. Hopefully that is helpful. Um, when using the bundled DXO editor, are edits saved so that when you reopen file for later, all control points are retained? Good question, no. So if you launch the NIC plugins from uh, Lightroom uh, or for D from DxO Photo Lab, um, as soon as you click the save button, that's a totally separate file that's been saved out in the history in your NIC collection or the control points, those things are not saved so that you can reopen and re-edit. But if you're using Photoshop and then you use smart objects, all of these settings are retained. So you can reopen and re-edit the image in a, you know, if you will, totally non-destructive process because you can you can see exactly um, where you, you place your control points and move them around and so on. Now, if you're using control points in DxO Photo Lab 2, you, you are able um, to kind of go back into control points and adjust them how you see fit. But as soon as you go into the NIC collection, from DxO Photo Lab, those things are not saved because it's a totally separate file. Um, so I had a question that that just came in, and I, I kind of answered at the very beginning of the webinar. Um, the webinars that we've been doing recently have been recorded, and it was to my knowledge that they were to be sent out 24 hours after the webinar is conducted. Um, and that that setting apparently wasn't on, at least in two of the webinars I just conducted, the IR webinar, infrared webinar, and then an analog effects pro webinar, well, here's three, as well as the most recent one, which would be um, Sculpting the Light. They were recorded, um, they are available. I don't know how or where they're available. So I'm gonna ask DxO um, exactly what's happening with those and if they can be made public either on the DxO website or um, on the DxO Nick Software YouTube channel. Um, that said, I turned on the setting for this webinar so that um, you should get an email in 24 hours and it will have a link to this webinar, this recorded webinar. So you actually can hear all of this over again if you wanna do that. Uh, hey Gordon, glad you made it. Um, all right, so moving forward, tonality protection. Another question that came in. So. Uh, the tonality protection sliders that are in the uh, global adjustments basically allow you to retain highlight and shadow detail. So let me show you this. I'm going to click into the histogram. I don't have any value that's super bright or super dark. All, everything in this image is um, kind of muted. But if I were to go in and add a bunch of brightness, and wow, I need a lot of contrast for this image. Okay, something, wow, nope, you know what's happening? I think in my levels and curves, yeah, I have a muted. There we go. Okay. So talking about the tonality protection sliders, let's reduce this contrast. I need to not have such a bright image. Sorry, I had to set this up a little bit. Um, the These two sliders here uh, attempt to mute or to um, retain highlight or shadow detail. So if I slide my highlight slider to the right, what it wants to do is take anything that it thinks is too bright and shove it to the left in the histogram, darken it down. So the highlight protection or tonality protection highlight slider is gonna try to protect those highlights from being uh, blown out. Or if you take this shadow slider to the right, it's gonna attempt to retain shadow detail. There, I don't think there are any 
shadow details to try to retain in this image. Um, all right. Absolutely. Pat, thank you for joining. Thank you for the kind words as well. Can you demo using the brush tool? Sure. Um, sending them out to participants doesn't allow me to watch webinars. You missed. If a recording exists, it would be helpful to have a library. Yes. Bob, good, good comment there. I'm going to see if we can have these webinars published um, uh, somewhere, whether it's on the DxO website or on the Nick um, YouTube channel. The thing is, Bob, is that uh, you know, I do these webinars for DxO, but I don't actually work for DxO, and and they're in France, and so um, not that that necessarily matters, but it can take a little while for um, to for things to happen because of the differences in time. So I can email them now, but nothing might happen for another day or two, depending upon um, if they're able to change those things. And Jack just mentioned that the IR webinar is on YouTube. Cool. Thank you for checking, and thanks for letting me know, Jack and us know. Uh, what is the physical address for DxO? Gordon, I have no idea, to be honest with you. I know that they're in France. That's about it. Um, is there anywhere on the DxO website that writes out what each of these sliders does? Cynthia, I don't think so. The, in around 2010, on the Nick Software website, there were a few PDF documents that kind of did that but I don't think that that exists anymore. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Can you demonstrate how to re-edit in SilverFX after saving Photoshop? Yes, so Lee, and then we had another question about using the brush tool. Let's, let's talk about those things really quickly. So I'm gonna go into finishing adjustments. I'm just gonna turn this film, or not the film, the image border off. And then I also am gonna turn the grain off because if I'm gonna be mixing two exposures together, um, I need to make sure that the grain is the same, basically, and that's, or or I need to like uh, think through how I want my grain to be, and we don't have enough time to do that. So I've turned off those settings. I'm going to click the brush button in the lower right corner, and the the brush capability here is built into the Photoshop version of the software. And what happens, hopefully, as we go back over to Photoshop, is our Nick Selective tool actually changes. So now we're in the tools section and we can fill in our entire layer, right? Which fills our, um, excuse me, it fills our um, layer mask with white so that we can see our entire image. If I click clear, it actually blacks out the layer mask. If I hit paint, I can paint my layer in using the brush tool. And, and actually, this is operating, for people who are familiar with and, and comfortable using layers and layer masks, th this is simply um, a, a tool that's built into Photoshop already. Um, and I would recommend, if you're not familiar with using layers and layer masks, um, you know, jump onto YouTube or your favorite um, photo learning website and um, learn about layers and layer masks because they will open up a whole world of capability. And basically this tool, the paint, erase, clear, fill button um, is just utilizing these layer masks. So I, I never use this tool because I'm always just doing it with this, with, with my uh, sort of Photoshop capabilities um, because this is actually a little bit limited compared to what you could be doing with different custom brushes and gradients and so on and so forth. But let's say we like what we've got here. So I've painted the effect into the top portion of the image and I didn't really do a very good job masking. Uh, you can see that reflected in, in my layer mask. But let's say I'm happy. I click the apply button and now the brush tool is basically made it so I've only brushed it into those particular areas. Now, my next question was how do you like pair different black and white conversions together. So here's how I would do that. I would make my initial black and white conversion as we did. I'm gonna turn it off in my layers, click on my background layer, and then just go back into Silver Effects Pro 2. And it, the there are a hundred different mindsets or thought processes for this kind of workflow. Uh, what I tend to do is I will um, look at the image and kind of convert the photograph, um, like let's say of uh, Ellie, the baby that we looked at earlier. Um, I will look at that image and kind of create a once over black and white conversion that I really like, focusing on maybe just um, 
the building or just the person, the subject in the portrait. Um, and then I'll click the OK button. And then I'll be able to go back into Silver Effects, like what we've just done, and maybe focus on a different part of the image. So now I'm going to go ahead and darken down the entire photo. And we're going to have sort of a half high key, half low key image. Darken down the midtones. And I'm going to brighten up the midtones. And what we're going to do is just paint the effect in. Um, not enough contrast. Paint the effect in where we don't have that other layer. In fact, let's just say we're happy with this. Um, I click the OK button. By the way, I, I'm not sure how effective this workflow is going to be on this image because it's not an image that I'd probably use the technique on. Um, I'll, I will maybe do it one more time and I'll just um, like focus on the building or one of the buildings so that you can see the major difference. Um, so now I have two layers of silver effects and uh, one of them looks like that, actually looks like this. And then the other one looks like this. So not even that different, really. I didn't really do that many things that were too different. Um, but now I'm able to, uh, using my layer masks, I'm actually going to drag this layer up above. And you can see what's happening now. I'm able to mix two different black and white conversions together. In fact, let's just do this one more time to drive it home. I'm going to turn off these two layers, my two silver effects layers, click on background, go into silver effects, Let's just lighten the heck out of the state capitol building here. By the way, as this is launching, in April of 2020, I'm th I think it's going to be April 18th, uh, RIT is going to be running what's called the RIT Big Shot, which is where we go to a really cool architectural location at night, we turn off all of the lights in that location, and then we ask the general public to come in and help us paint with light on the object or on the subject. And so we're going to be running this, this big event, um, April of 2020. And if you're anywhere near Albany, New York, that's when it's going to be. If you can make it to Albany, New York, I would love to see you there. Um, I know that that's a long way out right now, but basically we're doing scouting for, for this event right now. And then we're having to line up all of the stuff that we want to include and you know, all of the partners we want to work with and, um, you know, set up meetings with the state to try and get permission to even do it. So I've got a new black and white conversion. I click the OK button. This time, I'm just going to paint the effect in on the state capitol building. Um, and this is where learning how to use layers and layer masks and different brushing techniques and selective tools in Photoshop would be helpful. As much as I love control points, and they're a huge part of my sort of personal photographic workflow, um, I, I couldn't do basically half of the work that I do uh, without knowing how to make selections and adjustments in Photoshop. So basically what I've done here is I've generated a layer mask. I'm not going to be too careful with my masking. It'll be quite obvious when we turn on the other layers. But now my state capitol building is going to be brighter, have more contrast, and uh, give us the result might be interesting. And I've gone over the edge, it's pretty bad, but now we turn on that layer and turn on this layer, right? And so you can see the difference. And where this comes into play is less in this kind of image and more in, let's say, a portrait where somebody has one color eyes, like, I don't know, bright green eyes. You can use a blue color filter to make them go dark, but then you can use a red color filter to make the skin go bright. You know, there's, there's a hundred million different things that you could do in that regard. Um, Okay. Yes, and Diana, you can use the brush tool without it being a smart object. Um, and David just mentioned there is a book, yep, called Nick Software Collection. Um, I'm going to send that to everybody, David. So Tony Corbell and I think Josh Haftel wrote that book uh, very, several years ago, and it's all about the Nick Collection. And it would all be appropriate. I think they wrote that book before Analog Effects Pro came out. Also, um, Vincent Versace, who's a photographer out of LA and a, a Nikon ambassador, also has a lot of content about the Nick collection, and he's very good as well. Okay. Um, oh, what was the comment? Julian, so what site would we go to to learn more about the event in April of 2020? If you literally Google uh, the RIT Big Shot, Rochester Institute of Technology. I think it's just RIT Big Shot. The website is in dire need of updating, so don't don't uh, don't judge us on that. The project is really cool. The website needs to be updated. Uh, cool. And now, really quickly, I'll give another minute or so. 
um, if, if you have any more questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, I, I think I missed a couple, but there are so many comments that have been coming in that it's hard for me to go in order and, and read them. So how do you copy and move the control point? There are a few ways of doing that. Um, I'm gonna turn all of these layers off, show you that really quickly, and then we'll probably hit the road. Uh, so control points. There, there are numerous tricks with control points. One is copying and pasting control points. Um, another would be grouping control points. So if I move into my selective adjustments, I place a point up here, I brighten this area up substantially. I want that control point to be that size, but I want another duplicate control point over here. If I click on the point, I can hit Command C on a Mac or Control C on a PC and then Command V, and that's gonna make a crosshair, and as I place my control point, that is a duplicated control point. So any of the sliders that we've adjusted um, will be reflected in that duplicate. The other thing that you can do is hold the Option key down, and if you hold Option and click on the control point, you can drag that away, and that's gonna be a duplicate as well. That's Option on a Mac, Alt on a PC. And that, that's, that tends to be the tool that I use, is Option, Click, and Drag, because I can just kind of make 50 control points really quickly if necessary. Uh, if I wanted to group these control points together because I wanted to affect them all at once, I can highlight them. There are two ways to do that. You can hold the shift button down and click individually on each control point that you want to activate. And once they're active, you hit Command G on your keyboard. And now any adjustment you make to that grouped control point is going to affect those points. Um, or let me go back. Uh, shift command G ungroups those control points. That'd be shift control G on a PC, shift, shift command G on a PC or on a Mac. If I wanted to highlight them the other way, you can just click and drag. So you click somewhere not on the control point, but in the image, drag your mouse, and this is going to give you this bounding box, and then you can hit command G to group them. Good questions. All right. Red filter lightens and darkens what? Good question. So the red color filter, if you click on that, it's gonna lighten anything on the red end of the color spectrum. It's gonna lighten up any reds, yellows, and oranges. And it's gonna darken down blues, purples, and cyans. If you click on the blue color filter, it's going to lighten anything on that end of the color spectrum. So it's gonna lighten blue, cyan, and purple, maybe a little magenta. And then it's going to darken the stuff on the opposite end of the color spectrum. So it's going to darken the yellow, green, yellow, orange, and red. Yeah. Can you use Capture One as a host software? Yeah, technically, Linda, I think you can tell. You can basically launch an image from Capture One Pro into um, Silver SilverFX um, the same way you'd use any of the sort of um, plugins capable of of acting as a standalone software. I don't remember the exact way of doing it, but I do know that you can do it. And Linda, that one, I think if you were to Google um, launching Nick plugins from Capture One Pro, or if you were to search that on YouTube, you could probably find a short video. Um, oh, Fine Structure. Yep, Penelope, great question, fantastic name. Um, so Fine Structure, I don't think I covered Fine Structure, so thank you for mentioning that. And we're coming up on some extra time here. I'm, I'm totally cool. And thank you guys for hanging out, by the way. Um, but find structure. Structure is basically a texture adjustment. If I increase the texture, right, you're going to see more of those textures. It pops a lot more, especially these fine high frequency areas like the window panes and the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the rooftop here, the shingles that are on top of the building. You're going to see those sort of a little bit better, it kind of sharpens those areas. Fine structure does the same thing, but it kind of dials down or dives down into a finer sized objects, finer sized areas. So if I increase the fine structure, um, I'm going to see that texture enhanced, but, but sort of at a smaller or um, a, how do I describe this? Uh, it's, it's a finer level, if you will, which probably isn't that helpful. This image is not helping me to describe this either. I'm gonna double click on fine structure. Yeah, I think all of these things are a little uh, too high frequency. You can, you can start to see it in some of the marble work. I'm zoomed way in, we're at 400% on this image, so it's gonna look pretty pixelated, but uh, just to get an idea. 
So this is with fine structure at zero. Here's fine structure at 100. You can see it basically adds the little tiniest bits of contrast into these areas to bring out the structures. So um, I find myself using structure in combination with fine structure. And I tend to prefer the look of the regular structure more, but that's completely subjective. Uh, do you ever do a conversion of black and white and then blend luminosity to highlight clouds in color version? For sure. So John, there's there are blending mode tricks, and that's a really great trick. Um, I, you know, we could sit here and talk about all of these different tricks for hours and hours and hours. Um, but you know, I I probably should hit the road pretty soon here. What we're gonna do here. Um, there will be more silver effects webinars coming up. This is the last webinar of mine, probably until September. Um, but I'll make sure that on the docket will be like a, a silver effects intro, kind of like this one, or a you know description of all the tools. And then immediately after that, like maybe two days after, I'll do a tips and tricks where it kind of dives into um, other kind of more advanced things. So if you can make it to both of those, great, because it would act as a refresher and we'd go further. Um, and um, yeah, and then the tips and tricks one would be just to kind of move along and get some other stuff. Um, cool, Bob, thank you. Yeah, that's a very different webinar than the IR one for sure. IR1 was very hard. This one was much easier to, to do. Um, can you do an advanced webinar with ticks? Yeah, got that. Yep, Diana, I think that's a good idea. Uh, very good. Thank you for the kind words, everyone. All right, let's hit the road here. Thanks again for joining. Have an absolutely fantastic day. And uh, I hope I see you guys next month. Uh, if you can make it to more webinars this month, uh, Joseph Lenashke has a bunch of webinars. Go to the Nick Software upcoming webinars page. Oops, wrong one. And uh, you can see what's listed out in the next few weeks. Learn and support, upcoming webinars. Check that out. Joseph has a bunch coming up. Anyways, thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye.